Hello and welcome back to the channel, The Republic of Letters. Uh, as you might remember, a couple of months ago, in my first video, I talked to you about a book written by the philosopher Gustavo Bueno, España Frente Europa, and that book, that was a book on the philosophy of history, and it sort of examined the idea of Spain and the way this idea evolved through time. Now, in today's video, if you allow me, I would like to talk to you about another book on Spain, but this time this is not a philosophy book, this is what I call a hardcore history book. It is written by one of the most uh, distinguished economic historians uh, in Spain, Gonzalo Anes. As some of you might know, he became famous in the early 2000s, when he became the director of the Royal Academy of History of Spain. And I think there's hardly a student of uh, Spanish history that uh, hasn't heard of him. So Gonzalo Anes, to start with the author, uh, he was initially trained as an economist. He received his uh, first degree in economy and entrepreneurial sciences from the Universidad Complutense in Madrid in 1955. Uh, but later he went on to study economic history and in the academic term of uh, 1958, 19. Uh, 59, uh, he went on to study in France at the University of Sorbonne in Paris, where he became personally acquainted to and was influenced and taught by uh, historians and social scientists by the likes of uh, Pierre Vellard, Ernest Labrousse, and last but not least, uh, Fernand Brudel, the famous author of uh, uh, the history of the Mediterranean world under Philip II. Uh, later on, Anes uh, returned to his alma mater, returned to his uh, university in Madrid, and went on to receive a, a doctoral degree in uh, economic history with his thesis on the agrarian and land problems in the Spain of the old regime. This was in the early 1960s. And this book, it appeared uh, a decade later, in 1975, and it is widely acknowledged as being one of the best studies of uh, Spain of the old regime, and especially the 18th century Spain, the Age of Enlightenment. But the point is, uh, that just as was the case with the previous book I have covered in my videos, uh, this book, it sadly has not been translated into English, and so it is practically uh, unknown to the public uh, beyond Spain and beyond the Pyrenees. And uh, today I would like to sort of remedy this injustice and to provide a very, very short overview of this massive 500 pages work. So without further ado, let's uh, delve into the book and try to see what kind of arguments Gonzalo Anis makes and what kind of topics he covers. And I think that uh, the best way to go about sort of analyzing the book is to start by looking at the cover of this book. The editor, the publisher of this work chose um, the famous painting by um, Francisco de Goya called La Era, or also The Summer, as it is known in English, as uh, the cover of this book. And my guess is, is that uh, the reason behind this is that this painting, uh, produced in uh, the later half of the 18th century during the reign of uh, Carlos III, uh, this painting it is supposed to be an accurate representation of what life was uh, like in the 18th century Spain. Most of the country it was still agrarian, uh, pre-industrial, non-industrialized. And here in this painting we can see agricultural workers, farmers, sort of having a little rest from work. We can see horses. Uh, also, it is curious that we can see people of different age groups. Uh, we can see a couple of women. Uh, we also see children. There is a baby on the left. What is curious, well, the first time you look at this picture, you may not notice but one of the things uh, that sort of uh, caught my attention later as I started to think and uh, to think about this book is the fact that there are hardly any uh, older people in uh, the picture. And there is a reason for that, as uh, Gonzalo Anes makes it clear in the first chapter on the population of Spain of the 18th century, is that uh, the average life expectancy throughout the century uh, did not surpass the 27 years of age. So people died uh, young by modern standards, and of course the reason for this was uh, famine, occasional military conflict, and epidemics that uh, still persisted in uh, isolated regions. Also, another thing that sort of uh, caught my attention as I started uh, thinking of this book is the fact that there are few women in the picture, and they appear in the background and not uh, at the forefront of uh, the picture. And obviously the reason for this is because in Spain of the old regime, as in pretty much any country of the old regime, the societies were uh, very patriarchal. Women uh, 
you could hardly see them outside the house or in any kind of work settings. They were largely confined to a domestic sphere. In all these regards, we can conclude that choosing La Era or The Summer by Francisco de Goya as the cover of this book was a good decision. But at the same time, I would like to mention that there are many things that are left out of this picture. This painting, if you look at it, it sort of conveys the feeling of uh, happiness, of uh, tranquility, of peace. While all this was uh, true for uh, some isolated periods throughout the century, especially the larger part of the reign of Carlos III, I would like to say that the 18th century was still a century marked by occasional military conflicts and skirmishes with other European powers. It was also the century uh, marked by food riots, uh, food shortages, bad harvests, uh, which provoked famines and uh, deaths of considerable proportion of um, people. And with that in mind, let me move uh, to the contents of this book and uh, look at some of the arguments Gonzalo Anis makes. Of course, he starts the book by looking at the overall population in Spain. And as I said before, uh, the century was uh, marked by evident uh, population growth. We can see that at the beginning of the century there were 7 million people living in Spain. By the end of the century, uh, this uh, figure, according to different estimates, it reaches 11 million people. So there was nearly a 40% or something like that increase in population. And of course, Gonzalo Anis sets off to explore, uh, to explore the reasons for this population growth. And basically, he arrives at several conclusions. First of all, the factor of epidemics. He uh, says that although there were no uh, substantial improvements in healthcare, uh, people find uh, better techniques of uh, preventing the epidemics. And also, at the same time, the epicenters of these epidemics, which uh, Anis locates in India and China, they were not as active as in the previous century. There was uh, nothing comparable to the bubonic plague and the, the Black Death of uh, the 13th century. And one of the factors that uh, also played a huge role was the fact that the so-called uh, Black Red was gradually replaced by the Grey Red. Now, as Anis explains, uh, the Black Red it was prone to transmitting different kinds of uh, diseases to humans. It was very vulnerable to uh, becoming ill and uh, falling prey of epidemics and diseases, while uh, the Grey Red it was uh, less likely uh, to uh, catch the disease, and it was uh, less likely to pass on this disease onto humans. Now, uh, another factor that uh, accompanied and at the same time influenced the growth of the population was the fact that more lands uh, were put under cultivation, and uh, there were also new opportunities for subsistence, because uh, whereas in the previous century the average uh, diet of uh, a citizen in Spain depended largely on uh, grain and wheat, in the 18th century, we can see that uh, people, especially in the coastal regions, uh, they start to cultivate other crops, some of them coming from the Americas, uh, crops like potatoes and maize. And this led to the situation in which, uh, for instance, when there is a year of bad harvests, they can sort of uh, supplement uh, their diet with, uh, with these uh, new cultures, these new, new crops. There was a slight improvement in the welfare of the people, especially in regions that by the end of the 18th century were starting to industrialize, like uh, Catalonia. And so this is reflected in um, the population figures. For instance, we know that urban areas like ba Barcelona, they had 35,000 uh, uh, people living there at the beginning of the century. And uh, by the end of the century, we can see that the population of Barcelona reaches uh, 110,000 people. But on the whole, throughout much of the century, Spain remained an agrarian country. Most people lived off their land. And this uh, notable increase in population did not lead to immediate industrialization. Precisely one of the arguments uh, that Gonzalo Anes makes in this book is that uh, an increase in population is not a sufficient condition for the industrialization to take off. And he looks at the example of England. He says only when there's an increase in population accompanied by the increase in commercial activity, improvements in infrastructure, in roads and communications, only when all these factors uh, combine, only then can industrialization really take off. So while England and France, uh, they were uh, rapidly industrializing by the beginning of the 19th century. Spain remained uh, largely an economically backward country. Anes is very clear about that, because from his point of view, uh, there are sort of uh, two 
main features of economically backward countries. And these features are low standards of living on the one hand, but also the lack of professionals in the country. And if we look at the composition of Spanish society, we can see that this is true, that most people uh, lived off their land. They were agricultural laborers. There were not enough industrial workers. There were not enough artisans, uh, not enough medical professionals. For instance, Anis gives a very curious figure that for a population of around 10 million in uh, the later half of the century, there were only 4,000 uh, doctors and medical professionals in Spain. And he also points out uh, that uh, most artisans, they had to combine uh, the exercise of their craft with agricultural labor because this was the only way for them to subsist. Uh, the salaries were very, very low and it was not enough for a person to lead a healthy life. So, of course, uh, Spain of the 18th century it was a society dominated by what Anis called uh, unproductive classes. These are primarily uh, clergymen and priests. There were like 200,000 priests in Spain. Uh, this is not counting all the auxiliary personnel working in churches and um, monasteries. But also a great part of the nobility, they also sort of uh, formed, uh, they were a part of this category of unproductive classes because uh, largely their main uh, sources of wealth was uh, their land, which they rented to agricultural laborers. They also had uh, wealth inherited from the past. And one of the main aspirations of every person was to become a part of nobility or to study or become a priest. And this was due to the fact that uh, priests and noblemen, they were largely exempt from all kinds of uh, taxes that uh, common people had to pay. So looking uh, at the overall unproductiveness of uh, the economy, I think it is very important to mention that uh, as the nobility and the clergy, they were the dominant classes. They also possessed almost all of the land in the country. And uh, especially in, uh, in the case of the clergy, uh, this land, it was uh, permanently entailed to them. So this land in the property of the church, it could not be alienated. It was completely out of circulation. And the church, the clergymen, they alone decided what to do with this land. If they wanted to cultivate it, to grow some crops, they did. But if they did not want to do this, they did not do this. Only at the beginning of the 19th century, when the Spanish treasury faced a huge income crisis, they sort of decided to initiate this process called uh, desamortización or disentailment, sort of expropriate the land uh, in the hands of the church, bring it into the market so that uh, people could buy it and uh, cultivate it. But this unproductiveness, it was not only about uh, the land and economic factors, it was also about the collective psyche and about the attitudes towards work within the Spanish society. All uh, labor which had to do with uh, manual jobs or the so-called mechanical jobs, it was frowned upon, sometimes it was laughed at. A person exercising any kind of uh, manual labor was uh, immediately thought of as a person of uh, low social standing, a person of uh, low birth, while the idleness or the nobility in many cases, it was seen as an indicator of a high social status. And this was precisely one of the reasons for which uh, noblemen, who for some reason or other found themselves in a difficult economic situation, uh, they preferred to starve and sometimes to uh, die of hunger before entering into uh, manual labor and uh, doing manual work. And obviously the enlightened monarchs of the century looking at um, how other nations were developing precisely because of manufacturers and manual laborers, they tried to combat these prejudices and stereotypes of, through official propaganda, but also through opening of different uh, royal factories that were patronized officially by the king and uh, enjoyed his protection. For instance, there were uh, textile factories uh, started up in this way. Factories which, by the way, employed women, which was also a novelty for the time. But as Anis expli explicitly mentions in this book, many women were sort of forced to resign because they were treated with, uh, with contempt by, by, by their relatives or by common people that also 
worked in the town or the village where the factory was located. The government also tried to welcome uh, productive uh, migrants uh, from abroad. By the way, as Anis makes clear in the book, the number of uh, foreigners in Spain in the 18th century it uh, decreased uh, substantially, but at the same time, the technical uh, qualification of uh, migrants and people who were coming to Spain, it, it uh, increased uh, in comparison with uh, previous epochs and uh, centuries. So government officials, they uh, favored the entrance of uh, workers and uh, artisans and uh, specialists. They were all seen as productive migrants and they started uh, large uh, projects of colonization of uh, virgin uh, lands within uh, Spain, like uh, the famous uh, colonies of uh, Sierra Morena. The only uh, requisite which uh, would be, uh, which migrants who were coming to these uh, new areas had to meet was them being Catholics. So no Protestant uh, migrants were allowed. And uh, last but not least, a very important factor was education. Uh, technical or professional education completely lacked in Spain of the 18th century. University education, it was uh, geared towards uh, producing uh, clerics and priests. So the only things that were studied was uh, sort of Catholic dogma, a little bit of Latin and a little bit of scholastic philosophy, but no uh, practical skills. And the only institutions that uh, possess sort of this kind of technical expertise and knowledge and that could uh, ideally share it with the population were the so-called uh, guilds. But these uh, guilds, uh, they were um, closed and hermetic societies, which were very uh, disapproving of other people joining uh, their, their ranks. And that is why they were completely averse to any enterprise uh, which dealt with uh, spreading the knowledge and technical expertise. Well, and one of the ways in which this problem sort of was addressed is probably through the creation of uh, the so-called uh, Sociedades Económicas de Amigos del País, uh, the sort of economic societies. One of their roles was to sort of uh, foster knowledge. They also, in many cases, uh, had their publications. Uh, one of the most important public uh, speeches and uh, later disseminated as uh, publication was uh, the so-called uh, Discurso sobre el Fomento de la Industria Popular by a government official, uh, Campomanes. And in this speech, he sort of tried to combat all these stereotypes and prejudices against especially manual laborers that existed in the Spanish society. Also, he argued that uh, Spaniards are not uh, lazy by nature, as some other Europeans might think, but the problem was uh, political constitution of the nation. Also, within the university, although, as I mentioned before, it was largely dominated by Catholic dogma and the study of Latin, uh, there were uh, separate uh, religious orders like the Jesuits that were becoming aware of um, the many problems that prevented uh, the nation from developing and they tried to address these uh, problems through education. And for instance, uh, Jesuits, they distinguished themselves by the fact that in addition to Latin philosophy and other subjects, they also started to teach uh, natural sciences, especially botany, but also physics, geometry, and they also started to uh, teach living languages, like, for instance, uh, French. The case of Jesuits is uh, very interesting, because at one point uh, they uh, gained uh, too much power, and they, uh, they were able to influence uh, government uh, policy through their uh, partial monopoly on education. So many of um, the university graduates that were taught by the Jesuits, they later went on to uh, occupy high uh, government uh, posts. And I'm thinking particularly of the Marquez de, de la Ensenada, a notable uh, government official who initiated one of the greatest, uh, many of the greatest projects of the Enlightenment in Spain, for instance. Uh, he uh, totally rebuilt the Spanish Navy. Arnes calculates that there were around 40 ships, uh, warships, huge uh, warships built uh, during his um, time as a government official. There were also his uh, notable project of a unified tax system. But the fact that uh, the Jesuits uh, gained uh, so much uh, power and were able to exercise uh, their influence, of course, this gained them many enemies, 
and this was uh, one of the reasons for which uh, Jesuits were completely expelled from uh, Spain in 1767. And the alleged cause was uh, the fact that Jesuits were presented as sort of the masterminds of uh, the famous 1766 uh, food riot and rebellion which gained uh, the dimensions of uh, nearly a revolution. It spread from Madrid to uh, many other regions throughout the country, such as uh, Zaragoza, but also in Galicia and uh, in País Vasco. So this uh, 1766, the so-called uh, Motín de Escalache, one of the main reasons was the sudden increase in bread prices, which uh, obviously angered the population. So people rose up and the consequences they were uh, tremendous. Uh, the government was uh, forced to acquiesce and even the king was sort of forced to uh, come up and to consent to the demands of the people. But once uh, the riots uh, were finished, uh, the witch hunt for the uh, intellectual leaders of this movement was uh, becoming to gain force and many of the government officials, they pointed to the Jesuits. By the way, this famous uh, food riot, El Motin de Esclache, Ines argues that it may be seen as the antecedent of the French Revolution because it was uh, the notable occasion when uh, common people rose up against uh, the dominant interests and the dominant classes and um, they actually made themselves hurt and uh, they made uh, the powerful acquiesce to their demands. But it also, in its consequences, it was very important because it uh, paved the way for a relative uh, democratization of Spain. Well, as before the riots, uh, people from the laity, the common people, they had almost no political representation. After the riots, we see that the authorities decided um, at the municipal level that at least uh, one representative had, had to be elected from among the common people. And uh, this representative, he would later report to the royal authorities on the grievances and uh, demands that uh, uh, common people of each uh, town, or as it was called, municipio in Spain, had. So, as you can see, a uh, Spanish uh, education system of the time, but also um, its uh, social composition in terms of uh, different uh, professions and the productive and unproductive uh, classes, these two factors alone, they were enough to prevent Spain from industrializing and catching up with uh, Holland and England and even with uh, France. But there also was uh, another uh, factor which was a huge obstacle to economic advancement and industrialization and basically bad infrastructure and uh, lack of uh, communications and roads. Obviously, if, we, if you look at the Spanish landscape, you will find that it is uh, very irregular, that uh, there are many natural obstacles, such as mountain hills. And in many cases, uh, this made uh, the uh, transportation of uh, goods and products from one region to another almost impossible, or in any case, very, very costly. So we can see that many of uh, the reforms which um, enlightened uh, Spanish rulers uh, initiated they were meant to create, uh, to rebuild and to create a transportation network of uh, roads, especially in the reign of uh, Carlos III. A network was conceived that would sort of uh, link Madrid to all other regions of Spain in six directions, uh, forming a virtual star. But the problems and many obstacles to the implementation of these uh, plans uh, were very great. And by the end of the century, uh, many of them, they remained on, on paper without being uh, materialized in reality. Where we do uh, see notable advances is in the transportation of uh, travelers in uh, 1763. The so-called uh, Diligencia General de Coches was created, sort of a traveling uh, network, and uh, they were using uh, horses and uh, carriages to make uh, journeys uh, from Madrid to different coastal cities in Spain, but not only in Spain, but also uh, France and Portugal. So in six days, you could travel from Madrid to uh, Lisbon, you could travel to Barcelona, you could travel to Cadiz. And one of the interesting um, conclusions that uh, Anes draws by looking at the testimonies of uh, travelers, uh, Spaniards and non-Spaniards, 
is the fact that none of them complains of the bad quality of the roads, the bumpy roads and different ob obstacles that uh, they had to face. Obviously, it was still very uh, uncomfortable traveling in a carriage, but all of them uh, coincide in uh, complaining of the conditions of uh, life in the so-called uh, inns or small hotels where they had to stop at night. Apparently, the conditions were terrible. There was obviously a total lack of uh, service. A person, in order to merely uh, find some food and uh, subsist, a person all by himself had to go to local milkman or baker or butcher. Anis uh, does uh, debunk uh, a great amount of myths in his book. One of them is the fact that, um, well, when we look at the unproductiveness of the church uh, and the nobility, it is easy to conclude that all the noblemen and especially all the clergymen, that they were close-minded or uh, somehow unwelcoming of the Enlightenment. And while it was true in the majority of cases, we can see that there are notable exceptions and that there are enlightened people among the clergy as well. We can point to the example of the Bishop of Salamanca, who was one of the subscribers of the French Encyclopédie, and who even uh, promoted the reading of this encyclopedia, although it was uh, in many cases seen, uh, many articles were seen as heretical texts, uh, texts attacking the Catholic dogma. But we can obviously also point to the example of uh, Padre Feijó, Benito Ferónimo Feijó, one of the most prominent enlightened uh, thinkers of uh, Spain, who was himself a Catholic uh, priest. And uh, Feijó, obviously, he is uh, very well known in Spain due to his uh, masterpiece El Teatro Critico Universal, in, I guess, uh, nine volumes of uh, works uh, dealing with a huge variety of topics one of the masterpieces of the Spanish Enlightenment, but he also known as uh, the author of one of the, what was later uh, became known as one of the first, as one of the first uh, feminist uh, treatises in uh, Spain, his uh, famous uh, text called uh, En Defensa de las Mujeres, uh, so defending the women or in defense of the women, in which he sort of tries to combat all the prejudices of the time, which uh, saw women as inferior to men, or many of them blame women for all of men's uh, troubles and uh, problems. Another myth or common misconception that Anis um, takes uh, pleasure in debunking is uh, the popular belief that all the advances in uh, sciences and uh, enlightened uh, thought were sort of imported by Spaniards from abroad, especially from uh, France. He makes uh, the case for the existence of uh, prominent uh, scholars in the field of uh, physics, geography, and especially botany in the Spain of 16th and 17th centuries. And he says that, well, in the 18th century with the Enlightenment, these uh, scholars who were, uh, were themselves Spaniards, their works were rediscovered, and that uh, their thoughts accounted for a good part of uh, the advances that were made uh, throughout the period. Another myth that Anis uh, de Banks has to do with uh, Spanish uh, colonies in the Americas and their inhabitants, uh, the indigenous peoples, he uh, takes upon himself the task to combat this uh, stereotype according to which uh, the indigenous peoples, or the Indians as they were then called, were somehow averse to saving money and uh, were prone to consuming a lot, to spending a lot of money. And he says that basically the reason for this was not some kind of inherent propensity of the indigenous peoples, but the fact that uh, the only money that was circulating in the Americas, which was emitted by Spanish government officials, was uh, the so-called features. And these features, they lost their value almost immediately after they were issued. And so, obviously, it made sense for uh, an indigenous person to try to get rid of these uh, features as soon as possible by uh, buying all kinds of goods instead of uh, saving. And uh, Spanish uh, Empire in the Americas, obviously, it is the topic of uh, one of the chapters of this book. And in this regard, Anis expresses many of uh, very interesting arguments, which I will not uh, uh, examine in detail here. But one of the arguments he makes is the fact that the relationship between the metropoli, uh, the mainland Spain, and its colonies in the South America, it was not uh, the relationship based exclusively on force and uh, domination and sort of extraction of resources from South America to Spain, 
but he argues that uh, it was because of Spain, because of Spanish maritime and uh, cultural power that the uh, Spanish uh, colonies in the South America, they uh, finally ended up constituting a unity. He says that it was because of Spain that these uh, colonies began to trade between themselves. And he gives one particular example of the modern day uh, Mexico and Venezuela before the arrival of Spanish Empire. Obviously, these territories, they were completely isolated from each other. They had almost no uh, contact, no commercial contact. But due to the Spanish Empire and to its uh, naval force, they um, uh, began to establish contact. They uh, trade began to flow from one colony to the other. This leads me to think about one of the conflicts that dominated the 18th century, one of the maritime conflicts which, and many skirmishes which uh, the Spanish Empire had with uh, England. Obviously, the main objective of um, Spanish foreign policy throughout the 18th century was to preserve, to keep the Spanish Empire. But another objective was to reinforce uh, the Spanish monopoly on the trade with the Americas. According to Spanish uh, law of the time, Spain was uh, supposed to be the only country that had the privilege of uh, trading with the Americas. But in reality, this was not so because obviously other powers, uh, namely England and Holland, they also wanted to have uh, commercial links with the Americas and many times by means of um, what Spaniards considered to be acts of uh, piracy and smuggling, they uh, achieved nonetheless to surpass many of the restrictions that uh, Spanish monarchy placed on, on the trade with the Americas, and this gave the occasion to many military conflicts between, for instance, uh, Spanish and English uh, naval forces. But another major conflict that uh, Anis examines in some detail is the American War of Independence, and he argues that um, Spain had a role to play in this conflict, not only France, as was assumed previously. He says that Spain uh, supported the uh, 13 American colonies in their bid for independence and in their fight against uh, the British. And he sort of uh, implies or tacitly assumes that this uh, might have been one of the reasons why uh, the British later decided to uh, support the South Americans in uh, their struggle for becoming independent. A huge part of Anis's book is dedicated to the analysis of political problems of the century. And well, first of all, we have to understand in this regard that the 18th century is the century of the change of dynasty. Uh, the dynasty of Austria is being replaced by uh, the Bourbon dynasty with uh, roots in France. And uh, the first uh, thing, uh, the first program they initiate when uh, they reach Spain is sort of uh, the uh, project of uh, unification of Spanish country. And they start to pay more attention uh, to the domestic policy in detriment of the foreign policy. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, uh, Spanish influence in uh, Europe was in decline in the 18th century. Spain, Spain had lost uh, its possessions in Italy, uh, Sardinia. It also lost its uh, possession in, uh, in uh, Holland, uh, the Netherlands. So this, uh, all of these uh, factors, its loss of influence in Europe, prompted the new dynasty, the new rulers, to, to direct their attention uh, towards uh, domestic policy and... Uh, uh, domestic problems. Well, obviously, I think I could go on talking about this uh, more than 500 pages of books forever, but I think uh, the uh, things and facts that I've mentioned so far uh, should give you some uh, flavor of what this book is about. If you have occasion to sort of find it on the internet or buy it or find uh, reviews, please uh, consider uh, looking at this book. This is a valuable one of the best service of uh, the Spain of El Siglo de las Luces, or the Age of Enlightenment. I do recommend you uh, to um, learn more about uh, Gonzalo Arnes and his work, especially as he later went on to influence many uh, contemporary uh, Spanish historians. For instance, I, was, I would mention Carmen Iglesias or Carlos Martinez Show. So a very prominent figure and uh, a man who is widely acknowledged as one of the best experts in uh, uh, Spanish uh, economy in, of the 18th century, but also obviously the expert in land reform and agrarian problems of Spain.
And yeah, uh, thank you very much for watching these videos. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. I will promise I will uh, come up with book reviews dealing not only with Spain, but also with other topics. But uh, for this video, I've chosen this book because I couldn't I could not avoid it, especially keeping in mind that this valuable work has not been translated into English. So there was a gap for me to fill. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, watching this video, for being part of this channel, The Republic of Letters. Feel free to comment and to come up with any suggestions. I would appreciate it. And yeah, until next time, bye-bye.